Good evening and welcome to tonight's lecture by Professor Bruno Latour. My name is Arjen Klein Herenbrink and I will introduce Professor Latour before his lecture as well as interview him afterwards. Professor Latour is one of the most celebrated thinkers in the humanities and social sciences. He has authored numerous books and innumerable articles, plus various other media, such as art exhibitions and theater productions. For over four decades now, his ongoing work has been at the heart of academic and public debates about science, politics, technology, and the interconnections between the three. Some of, some of his first books, such as Laboratory Life and We Have Never Been Modern, are now considered classics in several academic fields. Originally famous for his studies in science, technology, and politics, his subsequent work increasingly engages with humanity's ecological challenges, as you can read in Oog in Oog met Gaia and Waar kunnen we landen, to use the Dutch titles of his latest books. The occasion for tonight's lecture is that tomorrow, Professor Latour receives the Spinoza Lens, a biannual award for leading thinkers who have made their mark researching society's ethical principles. To paraphrase from the jury report, he receives the prize for being one of the first philosophers to have shown that technologies are not just passive tools, but active parts of the very fabric of our society. Secondly, Professor Latour has argued since the 90s that our ecological problems ought to make us rethink our very notions of politics and democracy. Among other things, he recommends that we add the political representation of entities such as oceans and rainforests to the already existing representation of countries, identities, and ideologies in our parliaments. This being said, I have just two more small remarks before we turn to Professor Latour's lecture. First, tonight's program is a collaboration between Radboud Reflects, the Stichting Internationale Spinoza Prijs, and the Ambassade van de Noordzee. And I would like to thank all those involved for organizing this evening and making this possible. Second, as said, there will be a short uh, interview with Professor Latour after his lecture. If you want to propose a question for that interview from home, you can do so by following the instructions that should now appear at the bottom of your screen. And that being said, I now happily give the floor to Professor Latour. Thank you very much, Ion. I'm greatly honored to be in this uh, country that in French we call Nimeg. I know it has no connection with the way you in Dutch uh, call the city in which uh, you are located, although being located somewhere today is the most difficult thing to decide. I'm in Paris and I'm uh, opening the discussion that you kindly uh, organized. And I will use the great empirical example provided to me by the embassy for the North Sea. For those who are not uh, yet aware of it, we use uh, three different uh, topics. One of them is the work, very famous in Holland, on the Delta, which I visited actually 40 years ago with my friend Weber Biker and actually the, the father of Viva Biker. The other one is noise underwater. And the third one is uh, on eel, uh, fish, which I'm afraid I never actually eat, but uh, which seems to be very important in the local uh, cultures. I would use that uh, because I like to combine the very philosophical question of the parliament of things with empirical cases. And I will use the one provided to me. I have to say that I was slightly amused by the argument of the North Sea Embassy with this statement that the North Sea owns itself. Because of course, uh, coming from Holland, this was funny if you think that uh, four centuries ago, Grotius invented the legal conscription and the legal fiction that the sea belongs to no one. And the freedom of the sea was the great uh, way of Dutch uh, power structures started. So I was extremely interested, amused, but interested, because it's a great um, f food for thought that the same uh, Dutch uh, invention went from the freedom of the sea to the very 
interesting notion that the North Sea owns itself. I will come back to that in the third part of my lectures. I will first backtrack a little bit to explain what I meant, because many people might not know what this strange mystery of Parliament of Things means. And then, of course, inevitably, in the second part, I will begin to discuss why I changed slightly my conception of it. I mean, moving from a sort of social democratic version of it to a more tragic uh, one. And uh, at the third, in the third part, before concluding, I will uh, try to go a bit deeper in this uh, tragedy, which was not really anticipated uh, at first. So first, let me backtrack a little and uh, try to explain why I went to this notion of Parliament of Things. If you remember, for those who know my work, it was at the very end of a book, uh, We Have Never Been uh, Modern, but it was not, as some people have argued, to give a voice to non human, or rather it was a way to give a voice to scientists. <laughs> because in my view, uh, scientists uh, had a voice, of course, and there is no other way for the non human uh, to talk in a sort of coherent and factual way, except through the scientist activity and the scientist mouth, so to speak. But this voice was not clearly understood and uh, was uh, attributed very strange quality of certainty as if a voice from nowhere, which I found disputable. So in the way I introduce a parliament of things in We Have Never Been Modern is to say, wait, I mean, <laughs> we have congressmen and deputies and all sorts of politicians who speak for humans, but who are the ones who speak for non-humans? They are already there. And their voice is very important and entangled in the political question that we have to deal with, what I, at the time I call hybrid, a word I don't use anymore. And uh, these people deserve to be heard simultaneously as people who can be trusted, but also as people who can, like all representative of some other entity, be, if not uh, doubted, at least put into question. So the idea was to uh, use the notion of an extended parliamentary situation to make sense of the innumerable disputes we were studying in the field of science and technology studies, which at the time, I have to remind you, was extremely important in Holland and uh, which allowed us to work a lot with all sorts of the colleagues uh, here in Amsterdam, in Twente, in Maastricht, etc. And of course, now with the COVID-19, we, we know what it means to have non human speaking because we have uh, endless numbers of physicians doctors, epidemiologists, citizen activists, anti-vaccine people who all speak in the name of those entities. So we sort of know, it doesn't mean that they speak all of them in the right tone, but we sort of know that the so-called parliament of things is actually there as a competition of voices in a public debate. So the first notion was a way to say, uh, we don't want to have a system, especially because of all those disputes about science and technology, where we would have representative of the humans, those we elect, and uh, who are supposed to be uncertain about what they say, and we are supposed to have a whole regime of representation to doubt or put into question what they say. And on the other one, a voice from nowhere, which has no ground, no, as we, as we say in our jargon, no enunciation scheme, no way to test where is the voice coming from and whom they address, who would be the voice of science. So it was really a way, again, not to give voice to the non-human, but finally to hear the practical voice of the scientist speaking in the name of non-human with, as we know, 
this uh, double situation, which is so interesting to study, and many of us have studied it for the last uh, 40 years, that when they are right, is the fact themselves that speak, but a lot of work is needed to have the fact themselves speak. So it's a very, this very highly complex voice system in science, which uh, I try to, inter to put as sort of par with the very complex system, but much more studied by political scientists, which allows humans to speak in the name of other humans. And I always said that it's actually as difficult to be a good, a good politician as it is to be a good scientist, because the confusion and the possibility of corruption of both voice mechanism is, of course, immense, as we see now with the fake news. And actually, the whole idea at the time was to avoid a sort of excess of objectivity, which would have, it should have, didn't work, but it should have uh, stopped, so to speak, the, the fake news to develop. And that was not what happened for reason I will say in my second part of my lectures. The other thing in this uh, first argument, going back to the origin of my parliament of things is the word things. <laughs> it was strange to use the word things, but in old Nordic countries, as you know, ding is considered as an assembly. In Latin is res, and Heidegger made a lot of work on this etymology of the word res and thing as assembly. It's actually whole German cultures about ding which I developed in a big exhibition in 2005, making things public. And again, it was not to give voice to non-human, so much as to give a, a place, a location for conflicts, issues, disputes, and wars. The whole idea of a thing, actually even in old Icelandic, as well as in English or in the Latin and Greek country, causa, Aisia, is this is where you are assembled because you disagree. So it's actually the magnetic element of a conflict, what I call later matters of concern, which actually build the collective. So it was a very powerful way in the MIT catalog making things public, but also in many uh, work and politics of nature to describe the collective as made of those matters of concern, which attract around themselves disputed uh, parties. So it was to get out of the idea that uh, politics can be described without the matters of concern, which actually explain why people assemble. We assemble because we disagree. And this is why we are excited, so to speak, by uh, the situation. It's an old etymology and uh, we work at it quite a lot with Dutch philosophers, and I'm very happy to mention here Gerhard de Vries and uh, Noortje Mares. Both of them I learned enormously for making, doing, making things public, and Gerhard have worked with me for all of, the, all, of those, all those years. So this is important to say, to finish this first part, because it was not really an abstract question, should non-human be represented? Should they be given a voice? Or should we actually have them? Do we, should we really give them rights? But it was a practical way to allocate disputes and to hear all the voices which are simultaneously uh, fighting for being heard in the public space. This is why the notion of cartography of controversy was so uh, important for me. So even though, as many of the people who are interested legally this time by the notion of parliament of things uh, know very well, even though I've been very influenced by the famous book by Stone from 1972, it's a very old book, Should Trees Have Standing, it was not an argument about granting rights to trees or granting rights to uh, see, but it was the realization that already non-humans have an endless numbers of canals 
to have their voices heard, but those uh, canal, those uh, network, all of those uh, series of uh, uh, ways of being heard has no institutional basis. So we know that non-humans are represented by scientists, militants, artists, citizens, politicians, and that in fact politicians don't talk about humans only, they talk constantly about other things, precisely about things, about matters of concern. So the situation is not to grant rights, it's to build the institutional order which would actually make those uh, many different voices visible and, of course, allocate them. I mean, this was the whole idea of politics of nature. Do we have a constitution for that? The problem, <laughs> and this is now the beginning of a second part of my talk, what does it mean today, 30 years later? Because politics of nature, as I just said, is simultaneously obvious. I mean, everybody now understands but if you talk about food, if you talk about constructions, if you talk about microbes, if you talk about wind, if you talk about car batteries, if you talk about any matters of concern, we need some sort of institutional frame. And legally, there are endless numbers of uh, schemes to do that. Actually, uh, the Dutch are very advanced on several of the issues and suits which have been uh, pursued by young people to contest in court, in the name of the climate, the question of uh, climate change, as you know. And interestingly, the uh, Lord in London have stopped the third uh, development of uh, IFRO in the name of the uh, uh, Paris Agreement, even though it has no strong legal uh, status because it was signed, but it's not binding. It was nevertheless used by the Lord to uh, object and reject the IFU extension. So it does have a lot of uh, invention. There are a lot of invention around rights. Of so now it's, it's sort of <laughs> cause settled, so to speak. But <laughs> on the other hand, I was much too optimistic in the 1990s. I was imagining a sort of a framework of republic uh, a democracy, basically, just extended, but it looked plausible at the time. And I used in politics of nature a tone and a style reminiscing, reminiscent of uh, Rousseau and the social contract. I mean, except the style, of course, it, no one can imitate Rousseau's style. But the tone of the argument, the idea of a constitution to make sense of this uh, vo many voices, still was supposed, was based on the idea that you could actually have a common world where people would disagree, of course, and I explain in many ways how people would come to an agreement about it with this constitutional order. It was very clever, and I think it's still uh, useful, except <laughs> political Politics of nature implied that there was a possibility of a general agreement on the procedures. That is, it was a supposition, which we now understand was uh, overly optimistic, that you could have a people on the soil agreeing on disagreeing, basically, as the saying goes. That's not the case. I mean, we could imagine a social democratic order extended to non-humans, which was the case and it was necessary at the time, but it was supposing something which actually didn't stand. The privileged, reasonable human giving or <laughs> granting rights and opening the collective borders to non-humans would then be presented with the slightly condescending uh, register, which was used at the time, and still is used at the time, of granting rights to lake, to sea, to rivers, uh, or to the earth. As if 
we, we are in a position, we the humans, to grant rights to things which have no uh, rights. The model being as if uh, when slavery was abolished, it was a great act of justice to grant rights to the slaves. But it was to forget that we didn't grant rights to the slave. The slave took those rights and with a fierce, extremely violent, courageous and uh, difficult action. So the idea of granting rights to non-humans, even though it looks reasonable in the 1990s or 1980s because the climate crisis was not so strong and the non-human, if I can say that, didn't fight back so explicitly, doesn't look reasonable, so reasonable now because we have to deal with what was completely unexpected, except of course for some of the very advanced uh, scientists, namely that non-human will fight back and require, request an entry and a position into our co uh, constitutive order, which was very far from the condescending and generous gesture of humans giving rights to uh, nature, so to speak, as the saying goes. This is why I use the notion later of a new climatic regime, using the word regime with all its connotation, political uh, connotation. So the problem is that today, we are not in a social democratic uh, attitude where the question would be, are you generous enough to extend rights to this or that element of nature? We are in a tragedy. So we moved, <laughs> we moved basically from, uh, it's as if Rousseau had moved, if you want, from uh, writing the social contract to finding what himself in the time of the terror, so to speak. It was Robespierre. I mean, it, it, it's a shift of that level. And the social contract, of course, was very important during the French Revolution, but it was not very up to the discussions when tragedy and terror uh, began to uh, be extant. The tragedy, I've tried to recently to find a fiction, as I usually do, a <laughs> parliament of things is a fiction. I try to find another fiction, which is that we live in different planets. And I've just opened on Friday an exhibition in Taipei, in, in, in Taiwan. I mean, open is a way to say it because I wasn't there, of course, uh, where the title of the exhibition, Iron kindly mentioned that I was also a curator of exhibition and like curation very much. The title of the uh, exhibition is You and I Don't Live on the Same Planet. So it, it, this is a level of dissent where the argument we agree to dissent doesn't work. <laughs> we agree to disagree doesn't work when, to use an example which everyone would know of Mr. Trump meeting Greta Thunberg in the United Nations last year, or maybe it's now two years ago. And I don't know if you remember, but Trump went through a office to deliver one of his absurd talk and Greta Thunberg was there and looked at the, at the man with her prophetic eyes, dooming Trump. Dooming, but that's a prime. But uh, if you now live in different planets, it makes the constitutional order much more difficult to sustain and to Imagine, this is why, as you alluded to in your introduction, kindly, I wrote uh, where to land or oh, down to earth in, in, in English. That is, disputes which are beyond the bounds of the democratic ideal which has been developed uh, in the past. And again, the question has changed now in a way which I did not anticipate. It's no longer how would you welcome non-humans into 
collective. Collective is the work I was using to remember to uh, replace the word society. Society in the tradition is made of human in an environment. Collective is a mixed bag of all sorts of things. No longer how to welcome non-humans into uh, collectives. But another question. We have to discuss with people who say, who don't agree, that non-humans have a bearing on collective life. So the opposition shifted, if you want. Before it was, OK, we have all sorts of matters of concern. We have a sort of democratic order. Can we expand this democratic order to include the new issues, which in fact were not so new, of a condition of existence, the material reality with which the social order is being based? And now it's a different dispute. People don't live in the same place. <laughs> they don't actually live on the same uh, planet. And the discussion is now, there are people for which the question of non-human is central for their definition of humanity, of their own humanity, so to speak. But they have to fight with people who don't agree that this is a question. In other words, the climatic regime, the new climatic regime, distinguish now, if I want to dramatize it, maybe too much, but to make the thing uh, clear, human on planet, on planet Earth, and it's a planet, and in a time, or at a time, which uh, we would call modern. So that's one <laughs> definition of a situation and with the politics associated with it. And then there is another camp which divide all of us and every nation on earth, where you have what I call terrestrial being, and terrestrial is quite different from human, who are in a time which we now call Anthropocene. But it's not only a question of time, it's also, also a question of space, who live in what my scientist friend called critical zone. And actually, I've also opened a few months ago another exhibition in Karlsruhe, in ZKM, which is called Critical Zone, to try to explore the extraordinary contrast between the notion of planet and human living on planet and terrestrial living on the critical zone in Anthropocene time. Because it's a very different type of fight before the fight in the 1990s was we have a strong society, we have a strong international order, we could probably absorb the novelty of climate, the novelty of the limits of the earth, and it's just a question of uh, expanding the democratic order. And actually, as many historians of the environment have shown, it could have been done in the 1990s. 1980s, approximately the time, according to Oreskes uh, and many other people, where we could have acted at a very little cost. We did not. Why did we not act? Well, precisely this is where we shift from social democracy to tragedy. Because some people said, no, the question of the non-humans and the question of living inside the earth now define as critical zone with all its activity and including, of course, the climate transformation, what I call the climate mutation, is not and will not be taken care of. Very interested, of course, and very incensed, like many people, by the coherence of the Trump administration for the last four years. I mean, it's a sort of chaos, but on one topic, they have been amazingly coherent. That's in the denial that the situation is actually linked to the climate transformation or the climate mutation. So it's a level of, of uh, tragic descent, sorry, a level of descent, which has a tragic dimension, which I did not anticipate in the 1990s. I mean, it's quite extraordinary if you think of it, that uh, even in the United States, 
uh, they are no longer able to hold an election in a normal way. I mean, it, it shows that the extent of dispute and hatred is, of course, extraordinarily strong. And it's very strange now, <laughs> I have to recognize, I mean, this is a sort of a, not an apology, but a, a reflection on what I did before. It would be actually strange now to talk about the expansion of parliamentary processes when even the United States, the sort of beacon of democracy, cannot hold an election in a normal way. So the parliamentary model, in other words, is being uh, put to an incredible stress. And of course, the reason I'm most happy to get this uh, Spinoza lens uh, prize is because, as you all know, it was one of the tragedy of Spinoza's own life. The peace, the man of peace by excellence, was submitted to this amazing tragedy of civil war and wrote for this reason the Tractatus uh, Theologico Politicus. And as I said in uh, Irreduction many years ago, we are <laughs> have to write also a Tractatus Theologico Politicus for the same reason, that is, the level of dissent requires uh, an invention in terms of political philosophy that we could not fathom uh, before. I mean, maybe more uh, astute people could have, but I did not. So that leads me to the third uh, part, which is, of course, much more uh, speculative and in the spirit of Spinoza's uh, Tractatus. War and tragedy is what we are in. So the idea of a constitutional order based on the parallel with uh, the parliamentary process seems a bit uh, odd. But maybe it's because we have to modify the question, which is not necessarily should we give standing to non humans in a sort of generous gestures of granting emancipation, but following what I mentioned in the second part of this uh, introduction to the discussion, which is that it's not the case that non humans are waiting for us to give them rights. They impinge on us. They make us alive. So no more that you can uh, grant a great morality to those who fought against slavery, even though, of course, they were right, ignoring the fact that slaves themselves fought against and required, requested, torn apart the whole fabric of society to get those rights. This is the same situation with the non-humans. They are not there waiting for us to give us rights, but they force us to bow to something which looks like another power. So in other words, the situation is now completely reversed. And this is why I was so uh, interested by the intriguing quote in the North Sea Embassy to which I return. The North Sea owns itself. This is what is at the first line of a North Sea Embassy pledge, so to speak. I don't know if pledge is the word. But if you say the North Sea owns itself, what does it mean? It means that fishermen, uh, owners of tankers, dam builders, tourists, whoever go through the North Sea are owned by the North Sea. Or else words means nothing. The North Sea owns itself, which means that those who are actually asking for rights to go through the North Sea are submitted to an authority which is superior to them. In other words, the situation is no longer the one 
should we, by our generous act of expansion of consciousness, grant rights to monkeys, apes, forests, lakes, etc. But can we submit ourselves, ask for rights, request permission from those who own the land, which of course is a slightly different uh, project altogether. It's no longer the sort of attitude for 1972 book by Stone, Should Trees Are Standing, even though, of course, legally it makes a lot of sense to try to work out how can Bashamama, a river in New Zealand, uh, the North Sea, etc., have legal rights, which makes perfect sense. But still, the philosophical question is fairly different. It is not human in their own capacity and complete uh, strength, so to speak, allowed to grant, but it's human in a different sense and in a different position asking for rights from the legitimate owners. If I follow the North Sea Embassy proposition, and since it's an embassy, we can have an ambassador's discussion later, I hope, in the discussion that uh, follow, of course, because if it's a diplomatic proposition, I make another diplomatic proposition. If you say that the North Sea owns itself, then it means humans are owned by those powers. And in a certain way, I have to bow to this uh, authority. It's a topic which you might not want to discuss, uh, but which interests me, of course, a lot. It means that this ownership by an entity like the North Sea look a lot like what used to be called divinities. So it, it's a sort of, uh, it has no, not divinity in the religious sense, but sim simply in the way that you have to ask permission to do things from something which is no longer, not yet, or not completely human, which is a very old and traditional definition of uh, divinities. I've explored this question in a specific um, case, which is the case of uh, Gaia. Now, whatever is considered here, we need, and this is an important way to thank the North Sea Embassy for their invention during this year, and I see that they are the co-sponsors of this lecture, so it's fitting to develop that point a little bit more. But we need to go through fiction in order to understand this philosophical situation. In 2005 in Paris, with friends from my school in Sciences Po, we did actually organize a parliament of things for good. And we organized, uh, it was called Make It Work, there is a film about it, a cop like the one which have been uh, going for so many years on the climate, but with a little twist. And <laughs> the little twist was that instead of having a nation state like the United Nations model discussing about their interests, we added to them some of the entities which were matters of concern for several of them. So I don't, the Amazon was represented in addition to some of the countries which claim a bit of the Amazon. The Arctic was represented and also the sea, not the North Sea, I'm afraid, but the sea, which was a bit too large, I agree. And uh, also the lobbies, because we thought the lobbies deserve to be represented as such. And every single entity at five representative, of course, human representative, nice kids and students from Sciences Po and all over the place. And for one week, they fought trying to represent the COP a few months before the real COP succeeded in Paris. I've written about it in the last chapter of Facing Gaia. But what is interesting for me was that the encounter, and of course it was a fiction, because we were not mandated by anyone to do this, even though 
it was organized by a f colleague of mine who was the ambassadors for the French uh, real climate uh, conference. So it was a fiction, it was in a theater, but the result was extremely interesting because you saw that the very fact of having an owner there, Arctic, Amazon, Ocean, instead of just nation state, modified the path of the diplomatic discussion with the nation state. And this is a very important uh, result for me because it means that these are things which cannot be obtained only by philosophical work, even though it is necessary, not only by legal work, although of course it's completely necessary, but it has to be done in part by fiction to sort of scale model and uh, anticipate the way in which things will change to the definition of human state, nation state invented at the time. If you say, wait, the North Sea owns <laughs> part of what the matters of concern you try to organize as a, a human polity. And the, the shift in the discussion was for me extremely uh, revealing. I'd made the argument in my head that to see for a week 200 kids and about 50 different uh, institutions trying to negotiate what it means to be influenced by uh, other entities which are not representing human, even though it's a fiction, was extremely uh, important. It's feasible. And again, you learned a lot from the work done by the North Sea Embassy because precisely you modify the definition of humans. And this is where I will conclude my uh, introduction to this discussion, which is that, uh, this is completely speculative, but uh, that's a good occasion to do it. Maybe we should abandon um, the slightly ill-constructed term non-humans, which have spread everywhere uh, because of my work, and I'm slightly worried about its extension because it's becoming sort of an equivalent or a synonym of object. And it was, of course, not. It was a whole different uh, association, as I showed in Politics of Nature. So this is a tricky way to close these lectures. But remember, it's now a fight. No, it's a war. No. It's a dispute. Well, it's a tragedy which implies some humans who deny that they are allowed to exist and made to exist by other entities. And we don't need to call now these other entities non humans because they are the owners of humans. And there are people who say, yes, those I call terrestrial. And remember, terrestrial doesn't specify the species. It doesn't speci specify the gender. Terrestrial are those who are made, who, those who allowed any other one to live, so to speak. They are the one who made your life habitable. And if we follow the North Sea embassy argument, they are in a way, our owners. So it's a, it's a question now, not of granting rights to non human. It's a question of definition of humanism. Do we talk about human who deny their dependency, if you want, vis-a-vis -vis the terrestrial? Or do you consider that the terrestrial is actually bowing <laughs> and we have to understand what this bowing means, submitted, let's say, to an authority which is no longer there, which is, of course, a very complicated question, which is what is a polity that is actually not the sovereign definition of emancipated human making their own laws, but a polity made of people who actually submit 
and ask permission and rights to their owners, which is a very strange situation. Can you imagine the North Sea, where everybody will now, every time they fish or every time they tour, or every time they send a boat through the North Sea, ask for some permission, even though there are lots of tradition in the past and in other cultures where this is completely obvious. It looks very strange to us, especially to the Dutch, who have invented in the time of Gorsius exactly the opposite, that is the right to spread for the whole world and freedom of the sea without being uh, embarrassed or uh, encumbered by the ownership, in this case, of the English or the French. So we have been full circle now here. It's no question of granting rights. It's a question of redefining humanism. So this was just a way to start the discussion to thank uh, Aaron and the North Sea Embassy for holding this uh, meeting to reflect. I think it was necessary on the reason why I invented this strange notion of Parliament of Things. Why I think it's still important that has to be uh, slightly modified or slightly situated, resituated, if you want, because of the uh, tragedy of living in a different uh, planet. And this extent of dissent, I have to say, is a source of great anxiety to me because I don't see how you can reuse the parliamentary regime or the, the, the sort of way to think, which was, especially in Holland, built around the notion we agree to disagree if you don't live on the same planet at all. If there are people who say, no, 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 the non-humans are of no importance for the definition of human, with others who say, I am a human because I defer, I submit, I bow, to the non-human who made my existence possible. It makes life extremely difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture, Professor Latour. Um, I have many questions. If it's all right with you, I'll immediately start with the first one. Um, and that's more of a question for clarification, because if I think about Tragedies. In a tragedy, it's always already too late to act. Things are already set. Act. <laughs> so then, what is the what is the point? Um, or in, in what sense are you then not um, a, a complete pessimist about our future? No, it's just that it, it is actually too late to act. We are we are in a in a situation. This is, this is of course the whole climatic climatic regime. We the the the, the, the players are <laughs> the dice. Have been cast already. We should have asked. In, we should have acted in the 1980s, as I said. I mean, we, we still lots of things to do, but we are not in the situation where we were before in the 1980s when I was writing Politics of Nature, where we we were still seeing the problem arrive and imagining ways to solve them, just by expanding the social order, the constitutive order to non-human. Because precisely the, the key difference with the situation, the climatic situation, is that we have to pay, so to speak, the non-action, which was deliberately non-acting, as many historians of environment have shown. I mean, it was deliberate in the 1980s not to act. And that's what makes the situation a tragedy. Because what we will repair, what we will... Uh, manage to do, and we will, of course, manage to do many things, I'm not pessimistic at all, will not be able to go back to the situation where we could have acted before. So it is a tragedy in that very literal mm. sense, yes. Uh, and then to, to, to follow up on that, um, many, uh, many other thinkers who also, who also work with the same issues, who also recognize that we're past certain points where we could have acted more effectively, um, would say that, you know, looming ecological dis disasters necessitate or legitimate that we now grab our torches and pitchforks and we go after, I don't know, capitalism, major corporations, transnational organizations, and so on, all those um, responsible for these delays and so on. 
Um, but that does not seem to be the tone of your work, because in your work, it's, there's a great respect for diplomacy, there's a great respect for certain kinds of political, ongoing political representation. Whence this difference and this non-violence in your own work? Non-violence would be maybe too extreme. <laughs> uh, the whole argument about the, rev the revolutionary drive, so to speak, which is a very 19th century uh, definition of history, uh, was based on the notion of, um, of progress, so to speak. It was based on the idea that uh, if you move enough energy at a certain moment and at a certain point and exert a big shift, you will move to another situation, which is what in French we say, renverser le système. So there is a big system, and only if we act coherently for a little while, we would, of course, uh, go to another situation. This is actually completely different now, because the system has already been, the revolution has already been there. The system has already, this is, we, this is why it's linked to the question about uh, being late, we have already had the transformation, the mutation, and we have to repair it. So it's not a revolutionary situation, it's a repair, uh, which is what Anna Tsing and Donna Howe and many other people have very um, clarified a lot. So the whole revolutionary attitude was very well adjusted to the 20th century uh, argument of a sh system shift. It's very badly uh, connected, very badly uh, adjusted to the situation where, on the contrary, we have to repair a situation which has been made uh, tragic. And the other thing, which explains why it's so difficult to use the sort of old revolutionary ethos, right or left, actually, because there are two of them, is that we are divided among ourselves. So it's very difficult, actually, to organize camp where you would align all of the bad things you don't want to do and all the good things you want to do and make a clear distinction. Clear distinction never worked, but still, we had this idea before that you could make sense of a modernizing front and that the archaic front and reactionary one. But if you take any issues, including actually, I realize you have a, a glass of water and a, I'm sorry to say a plastic, uh, bottle in your thing? It's which not is mine. Huge matter. They gave it to me. <laughs> it's not my well, fault. Well, that's even worse. That's even worse. You didn't complain. See, you are yourself divided and you accept the situation of domination from the plastic industry. So this is where we are. We, we, we cannot order easily this uh, fight and make a clear line, which was a great idea of a revolutionary attitude. So uh, this being said, the situation is a war situation. So but it's a strand war. On that, on that note, and, and you, again, you mentioned it again in your answer, this idea of us not living on the same planets, us not recognizing that we live on the same planets. There's, there's, a, there's an image that I like very much in, in uh, the book that you, of course, know by Michel Serre, Le Contrat Naturel, where there's this image, I think, of Goya, and it's two men who are fighting, and while they're fighting, they fail to notice that they are in quicksand. And the idea there is that in these struggles, they would have to recognize that they have something in common on which they vitally depend. And if they don't incorporate that, everybody sinks into the swamp. And I think that a lot of us would like to think about ecological problems in the exact same way. If we all recognize what is going on with rainforests or ice caps or sea levels, then that would be a condition for the possibility of acting on something. But that seems to be impossible if we live on different planets. So is there anything that comes to take the place of that? Well, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice uh, way to phrase the shift between a sort of uh, so <laughs> social democrat version to a tragic version. Because there, I love a natural contract. It was written a few years before my politics of nature, was in a way optimist, much too optimistic. Because the metaphor itself, that is, these two guys fighting, the argument is that since they see themselves go down, and in the Goya's argument, they just die, both die, was supposed to have the effect 
of making the others, at least the onlooker, the one who look at the painting of the engraving, I forgot, uh, realize, and then they come to their senses. But again, exactly the opposite happened since Serre published his book and since I published my book. <laughs> the, 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 there is this extraordinary uh, set of cases in America, because America is always the example of extreme, where uh, the, the governor of Florida is actually forbidding everyone to talk about climate change, while the mayor of Miami has to move uh, the curb and the street slightly up in order to avoid flooding. So, no, the, the possibility of seeing a collective disorder, disorder and making people come to the senses is, has not been uh, uh, realized. Uh, and I think it's actually, in terms of social psychology, there's lots of people trying to do that, to understand that. It's exactly the opposite. That is, the more the consequence are being visible, the less easy it is to uh, take care of them because people say, and this is what I call the escapist of the exit <laughs> planet, uh, we will survive and you go to hell, which is basically the position of a Trump administration. So the more you actually see the consequences, the less there is uh, agreement about the collective order. So Sarah was as optimistic, as too much optimistic as I was. And if we then um, start talking in terms of what you mentioned as um, asking permission from entities like the North Sea, um, isn't that something that only would, would, would only convince or appeal to people who are already on board with seeing themselves and others as terrestrials? Um, the question then being, what do we do with, what do we do with everybody else who doesn't agree? Well, I'm not sure I agree myself with it. I mean, you should ask the, the, embassy, the, embassy, the embassy of the North, of the North Sea. Yeah. I mean, it's a quite, it's a quite strong statement. Uh, although there are lots of uh, legal philosophers who are working on this question of being owned by what you own. Uh, but it's also something which, again, like the Parliament of Things, is, is, is fairly obvious that you depend on all this entity which allow you to live. After all, what else was the experiment of a COVID-19, uh, if not a sudden realization that you depend, strangely enough, on the fact that Chinese don't eat pangolin, mm -hmm. which was a strange uh, element, but also that you depend on microbes, which I think I knew for many years. But so, it's not that far-fetched. What is interesting in the argument of ownership is that it gives a name to the reversal of situation, which is not, should I grant uh, rights to the sea, but when I fish in the sea, do I ask permission? Do I ask permission? After all, every single culture uh, would say, yes, of course, you have to ask permission. I mean, it's a completely common sense in anthropology. It's just very strange. Maybe this is, you should take responsibility for your grocious argument. You, but uh, suddenly this idea that, no, 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 no. The sea, is, we don't ask permission. We move through it freely. And it's us, it's for us to decide. So I agree, it's not going to convince the other one, the one who lives on planet um, uh, exit. Those, I think, are beyond conviction. The one I'm really interested in trying to convince are the one I call planet identity or security. That is, those, the second part of Trump <laughs> uh, uh, success, if you want, to have made this combination between escapist on one hand and identity people, because those are actually the one, the many, of course, who are left behind by the transformation. I mean, some of the people say, what, happen, what happened to the Earth? Like, uh, we'll go to Mars, or we'll go somewhere else, and we are rich enough. Anyway, we are so rich that it makes no difference whatsoever to what happened. But now there is a shift, because the people who hear that, even though they agree right now with the Trumpist, with the Bolsonaro and the others, they know they are left behind. They will not go to Mars. 
<laughs> I mean, you cannot. How many people are supposed to go to Mars? I mean, if you have six or seven, it would be bad. What about the millions, the billions? So those are the ones who have to be convinced. And it, 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 it's a very important aspect because populism is, is the great uh, trend of the day, even though the word populism is not so good. So it's very important to invent ways of talking about land and dependency and soil and country and people, which resonate at least with this uh, um, planet, this second planet, planet identity. I know it's, it's dangerous because it looks like something which would have been in the past considered reactionary. But we, we, I think we, we have to be attentive to that. To be owned by other entities is another way for humanism and democracy to develop, but it has to be carefully, <laughs> carefully followed, very carefully. And in following that, such a trajectory carefully, how, how does one um, avoid what you what you in your in what you write clearly do not want, which is a return to talk of uh, the high mud and the ground and the soil where you come from in the bad old, very bad old, um, let's say German sense. Well, we have to be careful, but Heimat has many other meaning and, and things have other meaning as well. We have to be careful, and yet uh, you cannot just say we should not talk about these things because they are reactionary. Because in a way, uh, I mean, historians of environment have shown that with great detail. It is a responsibility of a progressist and left to have left <laughs> all of these words of soil and land and sea and uh, animals, etc., uh, to the reactionary. But history is not finished. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great moment in, in Polanyi's uh, great book on the Great Transformation, where he shows how uh, the left left entirely to the uh, Juncker class, I mean, the German Junkers, uh, and in, in and the gentry in England, um, the complete privilege of talking about land and security. So it's not a definitive situation. It's an historical um, mistake, so to speak, on part of the left, and it's the especially the extreme left, of a, of a lack of link with the conditions of the earth, which let all of his words being taken by uh, completely reactionary um, people and reactionary movement. But when you start to talk about the North Sea owning itself, I mean, you have to be interested in what does that mean? What does that mean? And it's not identity. It's not in turn, I don't think the embassy of the North Sea has anything to do with an identity of the North Sea people who would defend against others. Not at all. It's a recognition of dependency. So it's exactly the opposite of identity. I often say that when talking about the Brexit, if you had asked the Brexit, uh, the, uh, the English to talk about their dependency, they would have realized they were European. But if you ask them, what is your identity? They say, oh, we are just whatever British or whatever fancy they have. So it's a question of interrogating in the right mode and all these words, which are associated, I agree with you, with dangerous uh, connotation, shift when they are in terms of dependency and not in terms of identity. And I think that's a very important uh, question for the next uh, years, actually. So then the, the, the political question par excellence becomes what do you need instead of who are you or who do you want to be? Right. Okay. Because, because dependency doesn't have borders by definition. Because you need, you need to, de what you depend on is not inside your borders. I mean, it's true of your own body. And that's a great thing with this idea of a uh, hollow bind, by in biology, but it's the same thing with nation state or it's the same thing with economy. I mean, precisely, the notion of dependency is exactly, goes exactly in the other direction, that identity. And this is why we can re 
we use with great care, <laughs> with great care, these words uh, of soil and people, which are, of course, uh, I know there is a whole 20th century history. But before the 29th, 20, 20th century and 19th century history, they had thousands of years of history. So we should not uh, preclude changes in the way we understand. Um, after these, these, these questions on, let's say, ecology, I, I wanted to address a related but different topic. Um, mm -hmm. and it's a question that I think you've already have gotten um, hundreds of times in the past decades, but um, since some of those watching will be um, introduced to you for the first time tonight, I'm going to ask it anyway. And it's a question about facts. Um, a 2015 a uh, working paper by our Dutch Scientific Council for Government Policy recommended that our government considers a more Latourian view of the world in light of the challenges of the Anthropocene. And the first thing that this uh, government report writes about you is that you do not consider scientists to discover facts, but rather to make facts. And almost every newspaper article and review about your work that has appeared in Dutch media states the exact same thing. Um, and the Spinoza Lens jury report also writes, states that you hold facts to be filled in, ingekleurd in Dutch, by the backgrounds and interests of um, researchers. So given that in Dutch media at least, your name is, seems irrevocably tied to this idea, um, I thought it would be nice to ask, what is the difference between your constructivism about scientific facts and knowledge on the one hand, and full-blown relativism, or even the denial of the established facts and the championing of alternative facts on the other hand? It is a full-blown relativism. What do you think? It is full-blown in the sense that it's actually related to the accumulation of conditions necessary to produce fact. And if there is something which is now being clear to everybody because of the COVID-19 is how difficult it is to make and stabilize facts. So the word make fact, I'm very happy to be uh, introduced into official document. Actually, I talk about this question to the queen of, of Holland a few years uh, in the presence of a queen invited by my friend Gerard uh, de Vries. So it all depends, of course, if the word making, if making is what fake news believe to be made, <laughs> which means made up, of course, it would be ridiculous. But if by making, it means assembling all the condition, including media, including, of course, financing and instrument, and including, of course, the uh, witnesses, which are themselves the microbes in the case of viruses, in the case of our COVID-19, and assemble them in a coherent hall, which holds through the dispute, then, yes, facts are made, and I'm a full-blown relativist. Like every scientist, actually, is a full-blown relativist in that sense, that nobody believes that facts are coming from precisely from nowhere. This is how I started this lecture tonight. So on that question, I think now everybody has been uh, enlightened by the COVID-19. Now. Behind your question, there is another one, which you didn't address directly, which is, of course, the origin of fake news. But fake news come from something different from uh, any interest in science. I mean, these guys don't look at science at all. Uh, they have decided that whatever scientists say is wrong, by definition. So it's actually, that might be too long, but it, in my view, completely connected to the climate crisis. When you have told people that the world in which they are going to live is no longer the one in which they were supposed to go, that is the planet, modernizing planet, they believe nothing of what you say. So it's not a question, it's not a, it's, the, the fake news is not, in my view of a, of a situation, is not a cognitive defect as if people had become silly. They don't want to hear what you say, period. But if your question was about are facts being constructed? The answer is, of course, yes. Where would they come from if they didn't need scientists and if they didn't need institutions and if they didn't need media and meetings and congress and papers and instruments? 
and all of those things assembled in a coherent whole, we would have no science. But all of that is now well studied by hundreds of studies and many other uh, cases than the one I, I studied. So the problem with relativism is that you have to go all the way. You have to be full blown. This is, <laughs> if you stop in the middle, and if you use the word make by saying made up, scientists make up fact, then of course, if you stop in the middle, it's ridiculous. But if you go on, it's fairly obvious. And every scientist would agree. It's the, um, to, to, to kind of follow up on that and perhaps play the devil's advocate, um, that does seem to imply that part of the, let's say, strength of a fact, the degree to which it can make itself felt in a society, um, also depends on, obviously also depends on human activity. The degree to which we circulate it in textbooks, into which we convert it into technologies and so on. So how then for an ordinary person, how to differentiate between what they see, uh, what is told to be f fake news, what is told to be real news, and so on. If you don't have, like most of us, don't have the competence to evaluate the quality of how a fact is assembled, how this one, how can one still be a responsible citizen in that kind of world? Well, there is no, there is no rule and no answer for that. In the old days, the answer would have been be confident into what the scientist, scientific establishment says, and confidence would have played the role of what you asked. Unfortunately, the scientific process, because of its complexity, is extremely uh, easy to corrupt. And it's corrupted by so many different uh, sources. The media is only one, but they are, the big one is, of course, uh, businesses. And it's, of course, um, sometimes, <laughs> other colleagues, and so on and so forth, so that uh, there is now, I mean, in fact, there was never any sort of legit, complete legitimacy of science, but the situation is, is much worse now. It's not only, I mean, studying scientific controversy has been my job for many years, so, and many people do it, so there are ways out of your question, um, which is to make, to map the controversy. But your question is more uh, serious, is that now we are in a situation which is part of a tragedy I mentioned in the lecture, uh, where facts are systematically attacked in a way that they have no, you, you, a scientist can no longer say one thing, immediately it's counter, counteract on the social networks. So on that situation, there is no way to guarantee, I mean, look at the COVID, I mean, I'm not sure how much energy was put into cleaning the desk on which you are giving this talk. I mean, you are talking to me on, a <laughs> on this desk. Is it useful to clean this? Does it protect you from the COVID-19? I've tried to look at the literature on that very simple thing. How long does the, network, does the virus just last? It's feasible to get some sort of cartography of a controversy, but it needs work. So if you want to be a, a citizen, an, I will say a responsible citizen, you have to dive into scientific controversies. Now, it may be sad, but it's the situation. Diving in the scientific controversy doesn't mean clicking free clicks onto your Facebook. It requires what used to be called research in the old days. Now, research means search on the social network. And of course, that's very different. So no, there is no way to stabilize this question. I mean, we, we are in the middle of, of, of scientific controversy. We were in the middle of scientific controversy before. But now we have this extra massive production of fake news, which, which complicated enormously the situation. But it's, again, it's not a cognitive problem. It's a problem of dividing between people who say, your world is not my world, get lost. Uh, that's not something which is amenable to uh, polite discussion. On that note, I'd like to move to some of the questions that have been sent in by our um, viewers. Good. Um, there are dozens 
and there is also a dozen that has been marked out by, by my colleagues that I should uh, put to you, but I don't think we have time for them all. Let's see. Yes, here's one. Um, you, uh, the, the question goes, you have already addressed uh, the problem of living on different planets, on planet, on, well, you addressed the problem of living on different planets and the increased level of dissent. What would you recommend that we do about the rise um, of conspiracy theories, um, such as QAnon and uh, related ideas? Well, uh, this, this was not the topic of a lecture, but it, it's interesting to try to uh, connect this um, conspiracy, not to a cognitive defect on the part of the people who are suddenly in the US or in France or in, I don't know about Holland, um, diving into the conspiracy so strange as a QAnon one. Uh, as if they could not read a scientific paper, as if they were not reading the newspaper. They do read the newspaper. They do uh, have their own cognitive uh, activity uh, uh, instead. I mean, in, in, in still working. But they live on a different planet in the literal sense of the word. That is, they apply to what we, meaning the academic establishment and the normal people, so to speak, uh, to which I pertain, uh, the principle in English, you, uh, uh, what's the English expression? Uh, whatever my country does, right or wrong, my country. When you say this sentence, right or wrong, my country, it means you are not open to evidence. It doesn't, it's not important. You are addressing a question of, of fidelity to uh, another country, an, a, a people, so to speak. Now, why would in the US or Brazil or Holland or France have people expressing this sort of situ attitude against other which they considered before are their citizens, I mean, are their compatriots, so to speak? The only explanation I can find is that they, they, it's, again, because of a climate regime. They don't want to live in a country where the notion of climate uh, is put into question. So they, you and I don't live on the same planet on that question. That's what they say. And then the COVID comes and they say, no, I don't believe in the COVID. And then it's another, anything can go on that sense. Nothing, we don't live on the same planet. The brutalization of politics everywhere, because it's not only in the US, I mean, of course, it's not so much so strong in Europe and in Holland, which is a highly civilized democracy. Yet, yet, it comes everywhere. We don't want to hear about what you say about anything, COVID, climate, economy, whatever. So it, it would be wrong to say it's a cognitive deficit. That's what I mean. It's a difference of land, of belonging to which land. It's a cosmological difference, which does not explain, of course, the bizarre inventions of a conspiracy. But conspiracy like Quanon is, is a sort of meta controversy from what I understand. It's a meta conspiracy. I'm not a specialist of that question, by the way. Um, no, yeah, um, neither am I. Um, but on the uh, subject of the idea of belonging uh, to land, uh, several questions here ask, and I'll, I'll read one of them, um, whether or not this uh, idea of belonging to land should um, steer us towards modes of living of indigenous people uh, who already um, are very, f who, have already, who have always been very familiar with these practices and uh, look to them and learn, to learn from them. Well, yes, of course, this is, this is the whole idea. And actually, the extraordinary change between the 1990s and now is that all of those attitudes which were supposed to be archaic and uh, in great need of being modernized, <laughs> modernized, which was still the case uh, when I was in Africa 50 years ago, uh, when I started my work, uh, has completely disappeared now. I mean, obviously, if you read a great book, uh, Frictions by Anna Singh, uh, 
uh, or many others, it's clear that these are the path. This is why I alluded to the notion of divinity, by the way, which seems to me behind the notion of um, the, the North Sea owns itself. Again, it's not religious. It's, uh, I mean, in the sort of Christian sense, it's, 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 it's being attentive. It's caring for and asking permission for, which, which is, I think, of course, a great uh, set of uh, indigenous tradition, which are now a part of our futures and no longer the archaic past, which has to be overcome. Yes, yes, of course, very important. I read a lot of those things. And on the note of, um, let's say, the various, of the various of these notions taken together, so the asking of permission, um, the returning to the land, the, the terrestrial way of living and understanding that you, that, you, that you are connected to many other things and depend vitally on many other things. Earlier in your talk, you said that in your more optimistic social democratic version of a parliament of things, part of what you intended was to give a voice to scientists who speak on behalf of these entities. Is that still a part of the more tragic turn that you're thinking about this has taken? <laughs> That's very interesting. Yes, I'd say yes. Uh, in the sense, finally, in the, now I'm working again a lot with scientists, um, the one who work on critical zone, actually the whole exhibition in ZKM in Karlsruhe is dedicated to their work. And I work a lot with on Gaia and so on. They are in a tragic situation because of the fake news, of course. It's, it's very difficult now to regain authority for the scientists, for the science they do. And the, 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 I don't think we imagine in the 1980s the degree of corruption of a, of a public sphere uh, where scientists would have enormous difficulty to uh, obtain their, their freedom of movement and their uh, funding for uh, open science. I mean, it has been very, very hard, especially for young scientists. So uh, now, before, of course, 50 years ago, I'm disingenuous here. It was nice to criticize their sort of uh, excess of authority. But now the tragic situation is that they are in, in a lack of authority. And at least in France, I don't know what it is in Holland, but the research system is extremely um, largely destroyed by the lack of support. And the idea that you could solve all this question of fake news and ecological question without funding and letting lots of freedom to science and protecting them against corruption uh, is absurd. I mean, this, this is a big, big prime. It's a very important question, if I understood the, the question rightly. And if, if, there's this, if there's this problem with, with or this change in, in scientific authority, um, some would argue that that is everyone's fault except, those, except that of the scientists. So to remedy no, the situation, we should all you know, sit down and listen to what science has to say. No, no, it's a, it's a, the scientists have been completely foolish in, in all of that. They entered into these discussions for the late 20th century. I mean, I knew that because I was taken in some of his disputes when I was accused of relativism <laughs> uh, without people understanding what it was. Uh, uh, they were trying to, to protect themselves until the very, very late 1990s, I'd say, uh, under the sort of... of, of fake protection of the old philosophy of science who, and that since it was facts are facts everybody would agree and we would do something for the climate exactly the opposite happened so yes of course it's a great responsibility the scientists were and still i except the one i know <laughs> i say most of them are still uh, working on the fantasy that uh, they would be protected against uh, dispute if only they could isolate their science from any sort of other activity and influence. So they have been slightly na too naive, I'd say. So if the right but way... As, to... as, as I said before, they are also submitted to uh, a level of, of, of uh, influence, uh, which is, uh, especially in the question which I know a little bit on ecological uh, question, which is uh, enormous. I mean, when you think of what the Trump administration did to the science of climate in the US, uh, they really tried literally to destroy it. They are still doing it now, even last week. So it, 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 to be a scientist now 
is a, is a hard job. So even though they were naive in the 20th century, I recognize how difficult it is right now. Um, and then perhaps as, as a closing question, um, if the if scientists simply letting the weight of their authority be felt, saying these are the facts, they are objective, and so on, if that is not the solution, if that does not work, then what is the, um, let's say, ideal public role or public manifestation of, of science that you would envision? <laughs> this is, of course, I'm terribly biased because I would say that the STS, um, the cartography of controversy, the way we <clears throat> not only, of course, me, I've been working on this question 40 years ago. Now there are lots of young researchers in SDS. I'd say in a sort of a parochial <laughs> way, uh, the STS uh, ways of handling this, this, this question is the best. Uh, I don't see how you could regain the authority that was possible for people like Pasteur uh, in the 19th century. Uh, but I think we should fight fake news. <laughs> so uh, I'm still on the same line as I was when I started as a young man. That is, uh, the more we understand how science is made, the best is for science and the easier it would be to gain confidence for it. Uh, I have to say that it's, it's a challenge right now. But again, the COVID-19 is a good uh, clarification we see Lots of things have been uh, uh, stabilized and proven and other things are still very much in the work in progress. And we all collectively, citizens, patients, politicians, all work during these six months. And we see uh, that we need all of those, uh, I mean, not all of those controversies, but some of those controversies um, in order to produce the science uh, which is incredible. I mean, the amount of science produced in the last six months is just staggering. So, yes, STS is the best thing that happened. <laughs> but again, this is my parochial. Well, that's uh, a very that's answer. a very, that's a very optimistic note to end on. It is. Um, it is slightly optimistic. I agree. Un because unfortunately, we have to uh, uh, start wrapping up the program. Um, because we're running out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Latour, for your lecture and your gracious answers to the questions. I want thank to you. Also thank, thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank all of our viewers for joining and remind them that you can also uh, live stream tomorrow's Spinoza Lens ceremony with not only uh, Professor Latour, but also Femke Halsema, Peter Balfebeek, Donna Haraway, and Chantal Mouf. And you can do that on the website of the Embassy of the North Sea, Ambassade van de Noordzee.nl. Um, I would also like to point out that a book of Bruno Latour's essays is coming out to honor this occasion and will be called Het Parlement van de Dingen over Gaia en de Representatie van Niet Mensen. And finally, I would like to ask you uh, watching to consider making a donation to Radboud Reflects via the About Us section on their website. Radboud Reflects is a non-profit organization, so each euro received goes straight to the organization of more interesting lectures and interviews. Thank you for watching, have a good night, and see you next time. <laughs>